Welcome to New Testament episode 20. Uh, we're going to be talking about Matthew 21 through 23, Mark 11, and Luke 19 and 20, and John 12. And any of you who know us know that we do a lot on the last week of Christ in John 12. So this is a little bit of a of overlap, but we're going to try to create it with a little different flair. Although I keep getting a lot of questions about the Sabbath, so I'm going to hit some things there. So this will be really good because when we do that, like the whole last week of Christ, we move really fast. Now we can maybe slow it down just a little yeah. bit and, and really hone Exactly. In and so this on. is also going to go into the inspection of, of the Lamb. And what's really amazing to me is as you actually get the days in the right places, all the scriptures fit into place. And you know which day of the week all these things are happening. It's really kind of cool. Anyway, and I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And we're just happy to be here. And never hesitate to give us a like and... And, you know, subscribe so that we're on your favorites list. And brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes and set him thereupon. So this is when Christ is actually set upon the colt or the ass. And um, all of you know that that is prophetic, that that was taking place. Um, the thing that's really interesting is he gives them an idea ahead of time um, that if the guy asks that owns the colt to tell him that my Lord hath need of him. So it, it appears there is a, a prearrangement there, either here or, or that it has always been sold for Passover. Right, and probably because they know that, you know, when the, Zechariah prophesied that when the, the Messiah, Messiah comes, would come yes, riding on the colt, right? And a very... Great multitudes spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them and <clears throat> in the way. And the multitude went before, and that followed Christ, saying, Hosanna, son of David. And then this famous line from Psalms, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, we know this as the triumphal entry. And we have inherited a little bit of a Catholic tradition here, and I realize that, that some of you might not totally sign on to this immediately, and that's why I'm going to hit it pretty hard, that I'm going to give it a pretty good description that you might know how this all comes together. And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city were moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So one year when we were um, doing this with our kids, we really had a lot of fun. It was so simple and so cute, but we just took green paper and let each of the kids trace their two hands on the green paper and cut it out and stuck it on a popsicle stick. And, and those were their palm branches. <laughs> and then we could, it was kind of we fun. We could sing, and it was, it was really quite fun. So. Yeah, it was fun for the kids yeah. as a, as a uh, triumphal entry day. Uh, and you notice um, I didn't say Palm Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Jesus of Nazareth. And that's in Matthew 21, 27 through 11. We're going to look at it from Mark also. I actually do a lot of scriptures out of Mark in this one because it kind of lays out a timeline of those first three or four days of the week. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off of trees and strawed them in the way. Anyway, so you can see this is almost an identical count in Mark as it is in Matthew. Uh, slightly different in the Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and into the temple, and he went and looked round about upon all things. And now the eventide was come, and he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So basically, that's mostly what happened that first triumphal entry day. As he, he came in and he interacted with the people, and, and it was actually a very praise day, where they actually praised him, and he said that even the rocks would cry out if they didn't. So... I have been getting questions to describe how come I come up with the things I come up with um, when other people are trying to make a Saturday Sabbath work. And I, I just, I decided to just take the time and hit this. 
Slow. Slow and strong. Because <laughs> there are many that go to the 3 or 4 B.C. birth, which brings us to 26, 27 for his ministry to begin. And I just want to show you, right out of the gate, number one, you got the reign of Tiberius, which totally disproves that. And you've got Daniel's 70-week ministry that comes forward and disproves it. You have many things that, absolutely put to bed this, but you still have a group of Messianic Christians who keep trying to make a Saturday Sabbath work. And I thought it would be fun today. It, it is a little out of the box. I mean, most of us, when we're trying to think, well, is it the, the Islamic Friday Sabbath or the Jewish Saturday Sabbath or the Christian Sunday Sabbath, we're trying to figure out which one um, we don't we don't often even, it doesn't Consider even cross our mind that... That the real Sabbath is Sunday. That... And some people might just turn off the video right here because they're so convinced. I know, know, right? Right, I've had that happen. Really they virtually thoughts. will not look at the evidence. But I'm going to present some pretty hard evidence today. Okay, because I'm going to go from the year 26 to 33, and I'm going to show you that not one of them creates a Saturday Sabbath based oh, cool. based on the observations of the new moon. I actually took and observed all the new moons astronomically from 26 to 33. And I'm going to show you them all. Cool. So, you you can, homework. so you can actually see this isn't possible to be the way people think it is. Right. And I and I think a lot of times it's a whole lot easier to, to say, oh, well, I don't think you're right. <clears throat> but then to present a case for what you do think is right. Well, I, I invite you to disprove it. I mean, if you can go back and do the homework I have done, then more power to you because I'm pretty sure you'll come up with the same conclusions when you're done. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's just uh, move forward. This is 26 AD, April. Now, granted, that's pretty small print and it's hard to see. Um, but here you have an actual calendar that I went back and stepped back and took a photo of a screenshot of each of these Passover weeks based on the sighting of the new moon. Right, and so if people want to check you, tell them how you get that calendar. What did you do? Well, in this instance, I used Apple Calendar, and I go back. They let you go to dates back to the year 1000. But then you have to click back the like rest of the way. One year at a time? Yep, yeah, one year at a time. You have to click back. So that takes a little while and your your trigger finger gets a little tired. So what you're saying is you can like type in the number one thousand and it'll go back that far, but it wouldn't it wouldn't go Yeah, it won't if go back. Type nine hundred and ninety nine. Yeah, you so just you have ha to minus one, minus one. You have one, to just one. start clicking back the years, which I did, by the way, again, just for this lesson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And you notice right here in Exodus 12, 3, speaking to the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take them a, 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 a <clears throat> take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Number one, you got to realize, that's saying in the tenth day of the month is the day that the lamb is selected. And I know most people just don't connect the prophetic types with the way it goes. But I just want to tell you, even in 33 AD, when Passover is on Good Friday, I just want you to know that prophetically and count-wise and every other way, this is the way it lays out. Go ahead. Well, while you're, you're I, I get that you're doing all the math there, but I actually love that verse because it is the first commandment to Israel. And the first commandment to Israel is to receive the lamb. That's beautiful. Also, the really fascinating thing, and, and if you've watched some of our other videos, like the, the, the Star of Bethlehem, a Hebrew wedding in the sky, we also point out that this is the likely date of his birth right. based on Book of Mormon quotes. Meaning um, triumphal entry. The triumphal entry is the day of his birth on a Hebrew calendar. Okay. So down here you see on the sixth, excuse me, on the eighth is the first of Nisan. Actually, the evening before is the siding on the seventh. The day of the eighth is Nisan one. 
And then on Wednesday the 17th, this is in 26 AD, by the way. Because we're going to go slow today, will you explain what makes it Nisan 1? What makes the start of a Hebrew month? Well, if you look to the left there, I had to cover it up because I couldn't get both slides on there. Um, but to the left is actually a, a screenshot of the Starry Night Pro software of the sighting of the new moon. And it's when the first visible um, crack of the moon is visible in the western sky right before sundown. That is the marker that starts the month or the moon. Well, it's, I, it's also important to understand that, you know, it's a witnessed event and it's 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 really hard sometimes to see that first sliver of the month for the new moon. It's, it's almost and, an occasion. Right. And um, actually in the new, new Old Testament, it, it was an occasion. Exactly. <laughs> they they got together for a meal for the two days of the, uh, the first day of the month. Um, so the thing that I was trying to say is that you you don't know whether it'll be the first day or or if you can't see it the first day then it's gonna you'll be able to see it the, the next 29th day. or the 30th day from the last and, and they would actually have either 29 days or 30 days in their month based give on or, a witness give sighting. Or take a day and you know like we have set 30 day months and 31 day months they would alternate it According to the moon. On witnessing the event. Right. Exactly. So you notice there on the 17th of April is the 10th day, which is the triumphal entry had it occurred in 26. Notice there that it would be a Wednesday. And it would make Passover, or the crucifixion day, a Sunday, which is not the Sabbath. And it would make the weekly Sabbath on the 23rd of April, which is a Tuesday. So AD 26 is a total bust. I'm just trying to go through this very detailed so you can see. Total bust. So astronomically, by the sighting, by the full, Passover full moon, is it by the Passover full moon? Close enough, yeah. Okay, by that <laughs> moon, we know that in that year, <laughs> we know that in that year, it would be, the Sabbath would be on a Tuesday. Yeah, so obviously... It wasn't 26. That would not make a Saturday. That would not make the Muslims right or the Jews. That would make nobody right. So it couldn't have happened in 26. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to move to 27. And we're going to show in the year 27 that the sighting would have been on a Thursday night. uh, Excuse me, a Friday night. And that Nissan 1 or the first day would have been Saturday. That would place the weekly Sabbath... On a Sunday in 27, by the way, which is fascinating, but not a Saturday. So if it was to be fulfilled in 27, it would make Sunday the weekly Sabbath. So there is another total bust of a Saturday Sabbath. However, I want to be very clear on this, that if you go to the calculated um, the calculated Passover in 27, it actually shows that Passover is two days earlier, um, making it on the 9th, which is the way most of the Messianics use to, com- to compute their Saturday Sabbath. They use the, the, uh, the calculated. mathematically calculated calendar that the Jews use. By the way, the, the rabbis say that they know that a lot of times with the mathematical calculations, it doesn't land on the right day for the moon. And they actually state that that is something that the Messiah will fix when he comes. Okay, but it's important to note that even if that were true, and it be the ninth, that would not make the uh, third day on the road to Emmaus land on Sunday, like everybody says, and wouldn't make it Resurrection Day. So what I'm trying to point out to you is in 27, which is the year that um, people like Michael Rood, who used the 70-week ministry, and a lot of them use as the crucifixion year with their 70-week ministry and everything, it's it's still a bust if you actually use the cited one, even if you compute it their way. But if you compute it the right way, it's still a bust. All of it's a bust, is what I'm trying to say. And we also know that is a solid three years sooner than even the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar being John's start of his ministry. So... All of this is just showing you how clearly that this whole Saturday Sabbath thing is a bust. It really is. 
it really does not work. And, and just to simplify this for anybody that maybe joined late, late after we started or, or whatever, the what we're showing here is that you can't just pick a year out of a hat and say that the weekly Sabbath that year, knowing that Jesus had to be off the cross for a Sabbath day and that he was resurrected in three days, knowing the pattern that we've that we have already laid out for the last week of Christ, you can't just arbitrarily pick any year and have that pattern work. Uh, yeah, and it's and, based on the moon. And I'm when I get to thirty two, I'm going to address another common theory and I'm going to dismantle it too, so that you know because, and don't get me wrong, some pretty good scholars have tried to put this together, but they have trusted, um, other calculated things and they've trusted things and haven't used all the scriptures and therefore they've come up with some wrong conclusions. Well, and let's face it, not everybody has the ability to go to an astronomical program and check the phases of the moon and make sure they're falling correctly that year for Passover. I would, I would, argument. I would agree with that, but also not everybody is as determined to... <laughs> <laughs> to to find all these As details and make sure it's right and cross the T's and dot the I's. I'm not sure that's a, a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is in a way, I guess. Anyway, so let's just move right to 28 now, and you understand that in 28, that would place the triumphal entry on a Friday, the 2nd of April, and Passover on um, April 6th on a Tuesday, making the Sabbath be on a Thursday in the year 28. So 28 is another complete bust. And you notice to the to the left here, I got the screenshot of the Starry Night Pro, and you see that little little orange spot that is the sighting of the moon just before sundown. Um, right, and, and you can see the phases of the moon in that little yeah, black in the, calendar. Yeah, in the calendar there. The side, so yeah. what I'm trying to point out to you is I'm not, I'm not depending on anybody else's calculations. I'm completely doing them based on astronomical observations computed by so astronomy software. And I also referenced the calculated dates. And most of them aren't that far off. But once in a while they are. Like, for instance, 27 was off by two days, actually. Um, all right. So now you see that 28 is also a bust. And it would make Thursday the Sabbath, not Saturday. So 26 and 28 AD are completely a bust. 27 would make a Sunday Sabbath. Right. Okay. So any way you slice it, so far we have no contenders. Well, you could say 27 is a contender for a Sunday Sabbath, but it's also ruled out by the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Okay. So moving ahead. Now we're going to go to 29. You notice in 29 that um, the sighting of the new moon is on the 4th. And the first day is the 5th, uh, the evening of the 4th, by the way. And the 10th day is on Thursday the 14th. And that puts Passover on April 18th. And it would make a Wednesday Sabbath. So we now have another total bust. Neither Saturday nor Sunday would be the Sabbath if it was in 29 AD. Now, you could perhaps begin to make a small case for 30 AD if you went with a 70-week ministry, which hardly anybody does, and especially in the Latter-day Saints, we absolutely believe in a three-year ministry based on uh, DNC 138 and and the Book of Mormon. I, just for, for people that, that might not be following this. Yeah, okay, so let's just do this again. We have unbrokenly stepped backwards in time with the unbroken chain of weeks. The weeks have not been altered. The seven-day cycle of weeks from Sunday through Saturday has been unbroken from us all the way back to this calendar we're looking at. In other words, there's never been an eight-day week. Exactly. This is an unbroken chain of calendar back to 26 through 33 AD. And we're looking at a true April as if we were looking at our... Well, it would be Julian back then, okay? And it is completely unbroken in the seven-day cycle layout. Right, and and I love what, the way you explained it to me once when you said, really, all you have to do is take 
the number of days from today back to that moon, divide it by seven, and the remainder is going to be the number of days off of the day that you're at. And, exactly. And, and you can actually calculate you it completely can that way. bypass every calendar change by just doing that. And refresh people because the moon, the lunar, is how they calculated it. Yes. What you're seeing on the left is actually a sighting of the new moon each time. And that's how we're landing the days on the correct calendar. Because this software will also generate a perfectly calendar going back. You notice that the calendar in the black on the left is the same as the 29... As the Apple calendar. As the Apple right. calendar. So they're in total agreement with one another. So you can see that the day I'm showing is the sighting of the new moon is accurate to know what's happening. And what we're trying to do here is clear this up so that it can just be put to rest. Now, I granted, there are people who have emotional conversions who will not have their minds changed. I have run into them. And I just want you to know, if you look at the facts and just evaluate it for what it is, there is no other conclusion possible. Right. So some, okay. some of these years that people proclaim just don't uh, work. Just land a, a Sabbath day in in the middle of the week that's not a high Sabbath. Yeah, and, and and typically you could say that nobody's got the Sabbath right and maybe it's in those weeks, but I'm telling you none of them work for a Saturday Sabbath. That's what I'm trying to point out. Okay, so we have on the 5th of April in 29 the first day of the month as we're talking it, and the 10th being the 14th day of April, and then Passover being the 18th day, um, being on the 14th day from the month, and I say month instead of month, so you can understand that it's based on the sightings, that makes a Wednesday Sabbath. There is no possibility for the 29 to give us a Saturday Sabbath. Okay, so moving to 30. Now we have the sighting of the new moon on Friday the uh, 29th of May, or excuse me, March, and the 10th of the month is on a Monday, right there, which in 30 AD, we also end up with a Good Friday crucifixion, if, if it did actually happen in 30 AD. But even in this case, we would not have a Saturday Sabbath. We would have a Sunday Sabbath, as we've talked about, because you got to remember we have a high Sabbath, then a weekly Sabbath, and then he is resurrected early morning on the third day when he goes on the road to Emmaus, which makes a Monday resurrection. And the scriptures actually say it's the morrow after the Sabbath, and this Sabbath day is the weekly Sabbath day. Right. So I, I'm, I'm hitting this pretty hard here. Now, I want you to know that it would require... Christ's ministry to have started at the same time John's did when he was 29 and a half and a 70 week ministry to even possibly get here. There is no way if you have a three year ministry, 30 AD would work. Okay. Just so they understand. So this 10th day is important. Um, and by the way, none of these make it Palm Sunday. <laughs> it's either Palm Monday or some other day. It's never Palm Sunday. Um, just so you know, and you can even see that within like a ten-year bracket. How, how well, from you do twenty-six it? to thirty-three. I didn't twenty-six. To 18, there's none of no other okay, people, eight-year bracket. Yeah, there's no other theories out there, so I didn't go beyond. Right. Okay, okay. the theories are from twenty-six to thirty-three, pretty much. Right. I guess there's one that goes to thirty-four, but anyway, I. I I didn't bother to do 34. Maybe I should have, but... Well, I, again, and also just to, to make it simple, what we're saying is, is if you know the year that he was crucified, then it's just a matter of doing some basic math to figure know. out what day of the week it would have been. Exactly. Okay, so jumping to 31. In 31, the sighting would be on the 11th of April. The... Uh, Triumphal entry would be on a Saturday, and Passover would be on a Wednesday on April 31, and that would put the weekly Sabbath on a Friday, making the Muslims right in 31. And resurrection would be Saturday. <clears throat> okay, on the third day, road to Emmaus. Now, jumping forward to 32. Now, this is a very prevalent theory by a good scholar. I actually like him very well. 
And he's a good Christian scholar by the name of Dr. Chuck Misler. Okay, and the reason he gets the 32 is because of the research of Robert Anderson, a Scotland Yard detective who created the book. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. Mm, it's not coming to me. And the works of Robert Anderson, The Coming King, or something like that, I think is the name of the book. And they use a very complicated um, mathematical formula of 360-day years instead of 365-day years. And then they multiplied it all through and come up with the triumphal entry being on the 6th of April, 32 AD, calling it the triumphal entry. And I want you to look at the, the map there and you understand the triumphal entry is actually the 10th of April. So now it's a first bust. Is it just flat? Isn't the day they say it is. And the second bust is that that would put the weekly Sabbath on the 16th of Wednesday, April 16th, making a Wednesday Sabbath. And Chuck actually says in his research that it comes up with a Wednesday Sabbath, but he, he dismisses that just casually. Like because it, it's easy to say, you know, we just don't well, know. there's probably a fuzzy mistake. Somewhere, yeah, there's, a, you know. there's some, but nowadays we can clear up that mistake. We, no fuzzy mistake. There is we no fuzzy count mistake. The days to yeah, it's true. absolutely dead on. So this would make the weekly Sabbath on Wednesday. And it would make Passover on a Monday, um, which totally is still a bust. Um, so that being said, I'm just showing you now I have disproved every year from 26 to 32. And we're using the year of Jesus's crucifixion to find the Passover moon when he was crucified and just count the days to that moon and see what day of the week it lands on. Yes, and, and for these previous years, I have showed you where Passover landed in those years based on the sighting of the new moons and the 14th day of the month, a full moon. And none of them create a Saturday Sabbath. Zero. None. It's just not there. And this is a good time to probably bring up the quote that we found of, um, of Hillel Two, or I think it was Hillel Two, where he said, "It doesn't matter what day of the week we worship on, as long as we do one and seven. So Hillel Two wasn't even trying to match the original Sabbath from creation. Actually, that that's in the Talmud. But the um, the other thing that's really important is that we and we have a chapter on this in our book is that we already know that the years on the on the Jewish calendar are messed up. They yes, know it. They All know you it. have to do is go to, to Wikipedia Google. and look up the missing years on the Hebrew calendar. They know that it's messed up. And again, it's okay. They, they know that when the Messiah that they're waiting for comes, that he will correct the calendar. But it's fascinating that we in the West have just automatically assumed that the their are days right. of the week and their calendar years are correct. And the, when we know that, that the they years deliberately are not, have messed things up. Right. And that, that that you can actually go to the Seder Alam and show that the reason the years got messed up is because they were trying to make it not land on, on Daniel's prophecy of the yes. year of Christ's crucifixion. Yeah, trying to get Daniel's 70-week prophecy to not be the Savior. Right. And Rabbi Jose in 70 plus AD, I think it was 120 area, I can't remember exactly in there, somewhere between 70 and 120, he actually is the guy who started promoting this new idea and then it got traction. And, and uh, his idea was that Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes were, were the, all the same individual and therefore he truncated all of their reigns. And that is where we get the missing years and that is where... Um, we get the absolute proof that they del they deliberately, in order to make Daniel's prophecy not point to Christ, change the numbers, come up with their own theory, and didn't document it and didn't make it true, in honesty. Okay, so now we're to 33 AD. And in 33 AD, which is where Daniel's numbers point, which is to where Joseph Smith has 
prophetic utterings of when it was. Everything about it fits. 33 AD now, we have the sighting of the new moon on the 20th, 20th, the eve of the 20th of April, or May, March, the new moon on the 30th, that puts the triumphal entry on the 6th of April, which is interesting. Triumphal entry in the year of his crucifixion was the 6th of April, which is kind of really fun when you think about it. And again, for those that are new at this, just just understand that I'm the s- Hebrew days walk on our solar calendar because theirs is lunar and they mm-hmm. add leap months seven out of 19 years instead of a leap day every four, year, four years or so. And so that's why April the 6th is... Okay, stop. I just made an error because I couldn't read that accurately. Triumphal entry is actually the 30th of March in 33, not the 6th. I apologize. The resurrection is the 6th. Okay, so let's get that corrected before we go too far. Triumphal okay, entry is the 30th. Let's go back to where you're calling out the numbers for this for April 33. So, do you and, want to do the reanimation of the thing or not that far back? No, we just okay. pick it up right here. Triumphal entry is on the 30th of March, putting Passover. Remember, 10th, look at this scripture in Exodus, the 10th day of the month is the triumphal entry. On the 10th day of the month, the moot is on the 30th of March, putting the Passover on the 3rd of April and the resurrection on the 6th of April. And I apologize that I I was looking down instead of up and and then I realized it was totally in air. While we're here um, talking about the 6th of April, I think it's important if, if if people don't understand, again, that the Hebrew calendar is based on months so if their seasons get off because of the synchronization of the new moon then they add a leap month every few years in our solar calendar when it gets off we just add a leap day every few years but the what that causes is that causes um nissan 10 to walk a little bit on our calendar i think it can walk Anywhere up to two weeks on our calendar. Well, even three plus. Depending where <clears throat> the new moons fall each month. And so... Um, I mean, I've it, seen Passover as late as 25th of April and as early as like the 27th of March. So it's pretty close to a walking month almost. Just like our birthday will walk on the days of the week each year on our solar calendar. Their, their dates... High holy days. Right, their high holy days and their, and and like Passover walks a little bit on our calendar. So some years is the triumphal entry is April the sixth, but some years not. Right. Now I want I want to state right now that in one sense of the word, maybe this doesn't matter to you. It matters to me because when I read DNC fifty nine, I realize that Joseph Smith says that the Sabbath we are to honor is. Sunday. And if you believe him at his word in DNC 59, then that is the day we should do our oblations for our Sabbath offering, so to speak. And you could either say, well, he just moved it like his typical Christian yeah, belief. Yeah, Constantine picked that day, yeah, right? Typical to worship Christian, the sun god, right? Typical Christian belief is that they changed the worship day because of the resurrection but the truth of it is it's not the resurrection (laughs) what's what's also funny is is if you say no 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 the sabbath can't be sunday that's the worship of the sun god but if if you pick saturday that's the worship of the saturn god yeah (laughs) if you pick friday all the days of the week are worshiping different pagan gods yeah but the, the the actual reality here is The reason why it was important to me is I needed to understand the morrow after the Sabbath. And you need to know the Sabbath to understand the morrow. And this became a very important ingredient in being able to find Daniel's numbers. Now, you could still come up with Daniel's numbers and not have a Saturday Sabbath using the seventh day of unleavened bread, but it wouldn't be a double header. It wouldn't be the seventh day of unleavened bread and first fruit. And still have a Saturday Sabbath. You meant Sunday Sabbath. So say that again. Okay. I'll repeat one more time, just so we have it clear. You could have a Saturday Sabbath 
and still have the seventh day of unleavened bread land on Daniel's numbers. But you wouldn't have a double high holy day hitting together, which is the seventh day of unleavened bread and first fruits or resurrection day. Whereas we do have it if you have a Sunday Sabbath, you have the morrow after the Sabbath or first fruits being also the seventh day of unleavened bread. Because the seventh day of unleavened bread isn't based on the Sabbath. Right. So you wouldn't, it's still a high holy day. It just isn't a double header. It isn't two high holy days coming in convergence. Like it really is. It really is two high holy days coming in convergence. <clears throat> okay. Now I beat this horse to death. Um, and if you're confused, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know how to explain it any better. But I can tell you that when you actually lay this out, and now you can actually lay out the last week of Christ and have all the ingredients work. I was watching a presentation of somebody and they says, you know, and they laid out what happened on the days. And then they says, we really don't know what he did on Wednesday. Because the scriptures don't give us an extra day in there. But everybody thinks there's an extra day in there. So they they just say Wednesday, we don't know what he did. But there really isn't an extra day. And it works just fine the way the scriptures are written. If you interpret it correctly. If you've got that high Sabbath in there where it belongs. And that you go back four days to the triumphal entry instead of five. See, here you go. There's one last little description here. If... Passover or crucifixion day was on a Friday and Palm Sunday was the 10th of Nisan, the math don't work. It's five days instead of four from the 10th to the 14th. So that's what I'm trying to say is Sunday does not work for the triumphal entry. And I, I think that there's probably people out there that are like, holy cow, Pharaoh, you're torturing the data and all that kind of stuff. But you have to realize that this stuff has to be accurate to figure out Daniel's numbers. And so that that is part of the reason that we're emphasizing this. Plus the fact, it's really fun to lay the last week of Christ out properly because everything Absolutely. makes sense. All of a sudden there's no hole in right. the middle of the week in Wednesday. All of a sudden it's Every all full. Every verse of scripture Fits. is perfectly clear. And there's one other thing that's really fun about it, and that is that it, it it does fill the gaps and it does actually complete the picture and besides that i'm just that guy <laughs> you know you'll have right? to you have to you have to now it's got to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am that guy i'm sorry uh, and i'm actually not you know truth is truth and it is what it is and it needs no apology it just it just fits and scriptures all work when you do it right. Okay. So, now on the morrow, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Okay, so he went to Bethany six days before Passover, which puts him going to Bethany on the 8th of the month, not, not of April. Okay, but that would put it into March, actually. And then when he comes from Bethany, the next day after the triumphal entry... He is hungry, so now we are on Tuesday. And he sees the fig tree far off having leaves. He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came unto it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. This is his cursing of the fig tree, which is figuratively saying that the Jews' time is not yet, in a way, they are going to have blindness in part until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And we could go to scriptures which lead us to the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled when Jerusalem is no longer um, oppressed by the Gentiles. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went to the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So we have this picture coming from, uh, actually from the, some of the videos in the church so church's sites of him actually chasing the money changers out and the Pharisees. And, and this is a symbol of cleansing the temple or cleansing your temple in preparation for Passover. But it's also what he was doing that was kind of almost forcing the Jews' hands. 
they got to the point where they had to seriously um, either accept him or absolutely they had to say blasphemy and try to crucify him. Now, <clears throat> we have here in Mark 11, 12 through 19, carrying on, where he's chasing the money changers out. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So now we've ended Tuesday. Okay? We just went through, and we know here now we've, we've gone one more day. Okay, so I'm showing you down here that the 10th being on the 30th of March, and the 31st being Tuesday, is the cursing the fig tree and the casting out the money changers. So now we're going to move to April 1st. And on April 1st, and they came again to Jerusalem as he w was walking in the temple. There come unto him chief priests and scribes and elders and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? In other words, he's created a big old stir. He's thrown the money changers out the previous day, and he comes this day, and now they're challenging him. <coughs> and they start to question him on everything. Authority first, doctrine all over the place. And I can't get into all of it in the time frame we are today. And Jesus answered, saying to them, I will ask you one question and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he's saying, you tell me something, then I'll tell you something. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answereth me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of men, they feared the people, for all the men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answered and saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. So he is he's flying in their face of their of all their uh, cross examination, the inspection of the alam here. He's actually completely calling their their stuff and later and I, I, I it's a little bit beyond my, the chapters I'm in but he basically says do as the Pharisees teach do as they teach you about the law of Moses or what they do but don't do as they do meaning they are they're saying the right things in lots of instances but they're not doing the right things they're living um, hypocrisy and they're taking advantage of the elderly. They're doing many things that they ought not do. So now we have um, the authority being answered, the challenge of authority on Wednesday. It, it's fun to do a study on all the different groups that are questioning Jesus because, again, the, the Pharisees, land the scribes, the has to represent all of Israel. So all Sadducee. of Israel has to symbolically inspect the lamb. Yes. And so you if you compare that you'll notice that as all these questions are coming at him, they're all from different groups. And it's really fascinating to watch number one, the types of questions that the different groups will ask him, but also to study how he basically checkmates them. He corners them on every question that they're asking till when you get to the end it says, and they just not ask him. Any more, more questions? He's completely <laughs> turned them inside and out, more or less. Because here in the inspection of the lamb, he has completely, perfectly caught every one of them in their guile, caught every one of them in their in pride, their, and their pride. Their caught, and and he has proven himself to be the perfect lamb of God through this inspection process. Yes, and this is beautiful. So. so they're going to have to decide when when all else fails, we have to kill him. <laughs> That's going to be their conclusion. Yes. we got to get rid of him. He's got to be blasphemous. Now, if you look at this calendar, you realize that the way you end up with not knowing what he's doing on Wednesday is you just move the 10th and the 11th and the 12th day of the moon back a day and make a Palm Sunday, and then all of a sudden Wednesday's blank. <laughs> okay? But... 
Anyway, just know Wednesday's not blank. It is recorded. Okay, so now, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having alabaster box of ointment and of spikenard very precious and she break the box and poured it onto his head and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said why was this waste of this ointment made for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor and they murmured against her now it's fascinating to note that we actually have two anointings one back on sunday and then this one on the morning of the 13th day or of Thursday before they actually have the last supper he is being anointed by Mary and it's really fascinating that the, the, the women seem to understand more than the men at this time they understand he's being anointed unto his burial um, well he's actually stated it yeah, several times but it's already like, it's but... like the the, 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 the the disciples have a mental block because they have this image that he is going to be this conquering king. And they don't realize that this mission was different when he came the first time. He was coming as the sacrificial lamb. So what they were doing is exactly what we do with the scriptures. We get in our in our heads, okay, this is the what way it is. it's all going to go down. So I have to read the scriptures in such a way as it makes to this true. validate my exactly. position, you know. And, and that's and, what we've done with the Sabbath, going back to the beginning of this conversa- or this class, or this lesson. Um, we've done that with the Sabbath. We have tried to proof text to Saturday Sabbath. The truth is, is it never was. And Jesus let her alone, said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always, and whatsoever ye will ye may do with them good, but me ye have not always. She's done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. He's making it very clear here in Mark. Hey, I'm about to die. And this is the morning before the Last Supper. So, you know, this material is broken up kind of weird. So this is kind of the conclusion of the scripture material I'm covering to a large degree. But I just wanted to show you that early in the morning on Thursday, they're anointing his body to the burying, to the end time. And then from there, he actually goes and teaches last day's information that Rhonda is going to present in her next lesson. So that's actually before or during that time of the evening of the Last Supper, where right before they start the Last Supper and that period of time, that discussion is taking place the day before Passover, after his anointing. And so this is very fascinating that it's filling in all this. And then we go to that evening of Thursday where the Last Supper is the beginning the evening and the morning of the 14th day. Anyway, very fascinating. Before before we end this lesson, I just wanted to make one more quick point going back to the fig tree that got cursed. And we've talked about that before, but, but sometimes uh, people aren't clear on the fact that Israel politically was that fig tree. And because they're plotting to kill him, the, the leaders are, then that fig tree is, is representing Israel kind of being cut off so that the time of the Gentiles, the gospel is going to go out to the nations uh, very soon here um, after his crucifixion. And so he, you have to notice in that verse that it said that there's only leaves on the trees. But if you go to the Doctrine and Covenants to section 45, and I am in verse 37, um, it says, ye look and behold the fig tree. So learn the parable of the fig tree. We have the restoration of the gospel, and now look at the fig tree. And ye see them with your eyes, and ye say, when they begin to shoot forth, and their leaves are yet tender, that summer is nigh at hand. So when you understand the symbology of the, the agricultural aspects of the feasts, you understand that Shavuot is in the early summer and that the summertime 
is pictured Weep. as the time of the wheat, the time of the Gentiles. And so here we, we have an explanation that during this time of the Gentiles, the fig tree has leaves. It has a lot of leaves, but it doesn't have fruit well, yet. Well, technically, this particular fig tree loses its leaves for a time. Right. But, then... but notice it had leaves when it got cursed. So I, the idea is that the, the leaves, because the leaves are coming forth here at the Restoration, according to DNC 45, the leaves are the gospel. But they're not bearing fruit with the Jews. Yeah, but if you yeah. got the gospel and you don't believe in Christ, then you got leaves, but you don't have fruit. And so I, I was trying to kind of emphasize that point because we often miss that in the parable of the fig tree. And of course, the restoration through Joseph Smith laid the foundation for the bringing forth of fruit on that fig tree again. But um, as, as we've been studying, there's a lot of prophecies still yet to be fulfilled before all of Israel believes in Christ and that tree has good fruit on it again. Yes. Now, kind of wrapping up in conclusion here because the next um, week's discussion will be on Matthew 24 and Luke 21, which is... Super exciting. Yeah, which is the abomination. The I mean, we're going into last day's prophecy and that's that's his afternoon sermon right before the Last Supper, more or less. Um, so this whole Matthew 24 thing is, is taking place right there, almost in conjunction with the Last Supper. We have this whole dialogue taking place in the flow of, of this last week. And this flow of these examination days before his yes. crucifixion. And him being anointed to his burial. All these things taking place right prior to his crucifixion. So you can be happy that the uh, that the Joseph Smith's Matthew 24 and all that is actually almost his last big sermon. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's his last big thing and he's describing Well, actually, describing he's going it. to give, you know, a, a lot of words at the Last Supper. Sure. So this is the sermon before, before that. The, before the ordinances that he does right. at the Last exactly. Supper. Um, this kind of feels like a cliffhanger, but in a way that's good because we'll see you next time, right? <laughs> yes. And uh, we're just happy to be here and we're really kind of leaving you on a cliffhanger, but I pretty much have to do that because my lesson ended at Matthew 23, which means Matthew 24 is the next lesson which Rhonda is going to give. And till next time, thank you and have a great week. Have a great week. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing with us. Yep, thank Parables you. Parables are so amazing. And until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm. I am super, super tired because by the time you finish talking and I, and I get to tell... You forget you know, what you're going to say. I forget what I'm saying. So hang on, let me think of it again. Do you still have a presentation? To oh us? my gosh, this is this is bad. Hold on. Um, I've been working since 3 o'clock this morning on that booklet. On that booklet. Okay. Oh my gosh, it looks um, great. Hang on, you were saying... <laughs> I don't know where you're going. <laughs> Damn it. Hang on, hang on. I'll so, think of it. I, I've got it.